Our scripture for today comes from Psalm 90, verses 1 through 12. <clears throat> Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn men back to dust, saying, return to dust, O sons of men. For a thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by, or like a watch in the night. You sweep men away in the sleep of death. They are like the new grass of the morning, though in the morning it springs up new. By evening it is dry and withered. We are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins, in the light of your presence. All our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. The length of our days is 70 years or 80, if we have the strength. Yet their span is but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. Who knows the power of your anger? For your wrath is as great as the fear that is due you. Teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. This is the word of God for you today. And Father, we do pray that you would teach us your truth and empower us to apply your truth to our lives. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Imagine that you were given $86,400 at the beginning of every day. You wake up in the morning, you look in your checking account, and your balance reflects an increase of $86,400. There's only one catch. You have to use every single dollar that day. If you don't spend it, you lose it. Of course, the next day, you begin all over again with another $86,400 to spend. What would you do with the money? Perhaps you would uh, buy a home at the beach. Or uh, you could finally get one of those super cool Ferraris. Maybe you would go for a trip around the world, living it up in the most luxurious uh, places on earth. Perhaps you would be spiritual and you would uh, decide to use the money to help other people, reduce world hunger, uh, help spread the good news of Jesus Christ to all the world. Think for a minute. What would you do with $86,400 every day? I have to admit, when someone just a couple of weeks ago won $1.7 billion in the Powerball lottery, I actually dreamed about what I would do with that kind of money. <laughs> Some of you would have benefited from that. Have I piqued your interest? Where did I come up with the number $86,400? You know? God has given us 86,400 seconds every day. 24 hours. 60 minutes in an hour, 60 seconds in a minute, totals 86,400. And even if we subtract out eight hours of sleep, I'm being generous there because most people don't get eight hours of sleep, it's still 57,600 seconds a day. These seconds are not transferable to the next day. You can't take them with you. You have one shot to use them. When they are gone, they are gone. You can't, you can't ever go back and relive them again. When we wake up in the morning, we know that, God willing, we have 86,400 seconds to use. How will you choose to use them? How will we spend uh, the time, or how do I manage my time, my 86,400 seconds, in a way that brings honor and glory to God? Many people struggle with time management, for many of us, we never seem to have enough time to do everything that we want to do. Uh, we feel constantly pulled in many directions at once. Others are unsure if they are spending their time effectively. And it seems no matter how hard we try, we feel as though uh, we're never managing our time very well. So today I'm going to look at uh, some of God's time management plan. 
First, if we want to honor God with our time, we have to realize that our time is not our own. It is God's. It's God's time. Unfortunately, we too often think that our time is ours to do whatever we wish with it. If we want to work, we can do that. If we want to watch television, we can do that. If we want to uh, waste doing nothing, we can do that. If we want to uh, go do things that we knew are wrong, we can do that. If we feel like coming to church, we can do that too. Certainly, God has given us the freedom of choice, but God teaches us through the Bible in Psalm 24 that nothing we have is our own. It's all God's. Look at Psalm 24, 1. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. God owns everything, and God distributes it to us according to his wisdom, whether it is our job, our money, our abilities, our personality, and even our time. It is a gift from God. I know you might be thinking, but pastor, I just went to the store yesterday and I, 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 I paid for everything with my own money. Doesn't that make it mine? I own my own home, or at least the bank does. Therefore, it is mine, not God's. But who gave you the ability to, uh, to do a particular thing well so that you could get a job? Who opened the door to give you a job which brought in a good income? Which gave you, who gave you the health to stay in a job? Uh, to get all that you have. God did. I'm not trying to put down our effort at work. God created us for work. And it is through our hard work that we get where we are. But the source of who we are and everything we have is God. God has made it possible by giving you the gifts you have, by opening the doors that have made it possible. If you are still skeptical about that, I, I think of the story of the preacher who once delivered a rousing sermon on God's ownership that frustrated a rich parishioner in his church. Uh, the wealthy man took the preacher out for lunch uh, and walked in through his immense land, including his farm and all of his livestock. And he said, now you're going to tell me that this land does not belong to me? And the preacher smiled and he said, ask me that question again a hundred years from now. The wealthy landowner had received all that he had as a blessing from God. God has given us everything we have as a gift, including our time. God did not place us on earth to take up space and to waste valuable time. It's God's desire is that we use our time wisely according to his purpose. I did hear a story about a man who worked at a factory, and one of his jobs at the factory was to blow the factory whistle at 5 p.m., uh, every day to indicate that the work day was over. And he walked to work each day and he passed by a jewelry store where there was a beautiful grandfather clock uh, in the window. And every morning he stopped and he set his pocket watch to the time on the grandfather clock. And one morning the store owner was out in front uh, sweeping the sidewalk and the factory worker asked him how he kept such an accurate time on the grandfather clock. And the jeweler said, oh, I said it every afternoon when the whistle blows at the factory at five o'clock. <laughs> that could be problematic. Um, but people live by the clock because time is important to all of us. Benjamin Franklin said, do not squander time for it is the stuff life is made of. And many uh, frustrated people seem to always fight the clock habitually as a way of life. They, they stay up late, and then they sleep as late as they can, and then they rush frantically to work or to school, uh, gulping down an unhealthy breakfast in the car, applying their own makeup or using a razor even at the stoplight, and talking on their cell phone at the same time. As I study Jesus' life, I, I'm amazed that he never seemed to be in a hurry. Although he was doing the most important job in history, redeeming the world. And although he knew he only had a few years to do it, as far as I know, he never ran. He made time to consider the flowers and the birds. He had, he had time to put his hands on little children and, and bless them. Time was his friend. The Bible gives us some, some great insight into how time can become your friend rather than your enemy. Basically, God exists in a realm that is not bound by time or space. 
God doesn't wear a Rolex or even a Timex. He doesn't have a day timer or a PDA. He is the creator of time, and he is greater than time. So the first step in making time your friend is to totally immerse your life in God. In Psalm 90, we just read, Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born or you brought forth the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn men back to dust, saying, Return to dust, O sons of men. For a thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by, or like a watch in the night. And then verse 10, The length of our days is 70 years or 80, if we have the strength. Yet their span is but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. And then verse 12, Teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Someone said time is a great teacher. Unfortunately, it kills all of its pupils. Let's use the four letters of the word time to help us understand its importance. First of all, T stands for treasure. God says we should treasure time as a valuable commodity. You number your years, or at least some of you do, um, but God says every day is so precious we should treasure it and number it. To realize the value of one year, ask a student who failed a grade. To realize the value of one month, ask a mother who gave birth to a premature baby. How about an hour? Ask the businessman whose flight was delayed an hour and he missed an important business deal. How valuable is one minute? Ask the man who had a heart attack in the restaurant and an EMT just happened to be at the next table and CPR saved his life. How valuable is a second? Ask the person who barely missed a head-on with an oncoming car. How valuable is a millisecond? Ask the Olympic swimmer who missed qualifying by six-tenths. Time is really valuable. So learn a couple of things about what this means for your family. Treasure every moment you have. Yesterday is history. Tomorrow is a mystery. Today is a gift. That's why it's called the present. (laughs) You can make more money, but you can't make more time. Have you ever heard the expression, time is money? Yeah, it's not true. Time is much more valuable than money. It may be hard to make more money, but it can be done. But it is totally impossible to make more time. Time is more valuable than money. A.W. Tozer wrote this. He said, time is a resource that is non-renewable and non-transferable. You cannot store it up, uh, slow it up, hold it up, divide it up, or give it up. You can't hoard it up or save it for a rainy day. When it's lost, it's unrecoverable. When you kill time, remember that it has no resurrection. So understand that you should treasure time as the most valuable asset you're given in this world. The next letter in time is I, invest. We use a a lot of phrases with time that aren't really possible. You, You can't buy more time. You can't really find more time. We speak of making time, but that's impossible too. So number one, you can't save time, you can only invest it. As we said, time is more valuable than money, but it's, it's like money in that it can be spent and invested. It's different from money, though, because while money can be saved, time can't. If you don't use it, you lose it forever. In the early 1970s, Jim Croce wrote a song uh, you may remember. If I could save time in a bottle... The first thing that I'd like to do is to save every day till eternity passes away just to spend them with you. Great lyrics, huh? Beautiful. And it would be nice if we could save time, but you can't. And in fact, in just a few months after he wrote that song, he was tragically killed in a plane crash in Natchitoches, Louisiana at the age of 30. You can't save time. 
We have all kinds of time-saving appliances, like microwave ovens. Guys love to take shortcuts to save time. Show me some of the time you saved. Where is it? You can't save time. You can only invest it. At a graduation commencement of his alma mater, uh, Wheaton College, Billy Graham said this, Time is the capital that God has given us to invest. People are the stocks in which we are to invest our time, whether they're blue chips or penny stocks or even junk bonds. Secondly, where you invest your time reveals what is most important to you. There are 168 golden hours each week. And the average person will spend about 56 of those hours sleeping. About 24 of those hours eating and personal hygiene and about 50 of those hours working or traveling to work. That means there are only about 38 hours a week of discretionary time left over. That's about five and a half hours a day. Where are you investing those hours? If I were to follow you around and observe you for those five and a half hours, after about 10 days, I could tell you what is most important in your life. You might not like it or agree with it, but for some of you, surfing the internet is most important to you. For others of you, watching television or reading magazines or whatever is most important. How much of that discretionary time are you devoting to the Lord? How much are you devoting to your family? In a study of 1,500 households at the University of Michigan, they found mothers working outside the home spend an average of 11 minutes a day on weekdays and 30 minutes a day on weekends with their children, not including mealtime. Fathers spend an average of 8 minutes a day on weekdays and 14 minutes a day on weekends in different activities with their children. Have you ever heard this excuse? Some dad or mom will say, I don't spend much time with my family, but the little time I do spend is quality time. You heard that? I don't don't like that phrase because it's most often used as an excuse for not spending much time together. Quality time is really a misnomer because all time has the same quality. Consider this second. Was it of higher quality than the previous second? Or how about the second right now? It's like talking about quality money. If I offered you a $100 bill, would you say, no, no, it's wrinkled. I'd rather have that crisp new $5 bill instead. It has better quality. Hello? I I prefer the phrase fun family time or meaningful family time, but there is no substitute for investing a large quantity of time with your family. If they are important, you'll indicate it by the amount of discretionary time you give them. The next letter in time is M, manage. Now, I remind you today that all the money we receive comes from God and we only manage it. The same can be true of time. God is the creator of time. He alone controls it. I'm sure you've seen the illustration uh, of a time management expert uh, teaching a seminar for executives and he placed a large, clear, open mouth jar in front of the group and next he put in seven or eight large rocks in the jar until it was full and he asked the class, is the jar full? And they said, yeah, yeah. Then he took out some pebbles and he poured the pebbles in that filled in all the extra space around the big rocks uh, until they reached the rim. He said, now is the jar full? And uh, by now they didn't answer. Uh, So then he poured in some fine sand to fill up the rest of the jar. He says, the jar full? And some nodded. Well, then he proceeded to take a pitcher of water and poured water into the jar up to the rim. And he said, what's the lesson about time management? And hands flew into the air and and everyone agreed. The lesson is, no matter how busy you are, you can always fit more things into your schedule. Wrong. (laughs) 
the lesson is, unless you put the big rocks in first, they will never fit in. You must figure out what the big rocks are for you. What are the big rocks, the priorities in your life? Giving time to God? Giving time to your marriage or to your children? Giving time to your church or your small group or to your, the, your ministry of service to others? If you don't put those big rocks in first, someone else will fill up your jar. Understand this, first of all, every moment is a gift from God that must be managed wisely. There's an entire field of study called time management. And most, uh, most uh, every major business consultants are hired to uh, uh, teach busy executives how to manage their time. Time management is a hot topic. And in his book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, Stephen Covey writes, time management is a misleading concept. You can't really manage time. You can't delay it, speed it up, save it, or lose it. No matter what you do, time keeps moving forward at the same rate. The challenge is not to manage time, but to manage ourselves. The Bible uses another word. Uh, instead of managing your time, it speaks of redeeming the time, which is an even better idea. Paul writes this, he said, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. The, the phrase walk circumspectly means to be constantly looking around, to make the most of every opportunity. Emmett Smith was a great football running back, but he was not the, the biggest or the fastest or the strongest. Uh, what he excelled at was running with his eyes open, and he was one of the best at seeing holes uh, as they open and then running through them. And that's the way we should live, live redeeming the time, looking for every opportunity to invest time wisely and then darting through those times. When the opportunity passes, it can't be reclaimed. It's gone forever. But that's what it means to redeem the time. Secondly, as we said, if you don't manage your time, someone else will manage it for you. You can't save time or even waste time. You are going to spend it somewhere. You're going to invest it in someone or something. And if you don't control your schedule, someone will always be happy to do it for you. I have a lot of things I give you to do. Some people complain they just don't have enough time to spend with their family. Listen, you've got exactly the same amount of time as everyone else. You just aren't managing your time wisely or managing yourself wisely. The most important time you will invest will be in your family. Many of you remember the song Cats in the Cradle by Harry Chapin. Uh, we sing it every year on Father's Day as sort of a second sermon. Um, I'm not going to sing it again now. Um, but you remember what it's about, right? It's about uh, the father who doesn't take time for his son, uh, and then he realizes later in life that his son doesn't have time for him. And maybe you know the song, but here's the rest of the story. Harry Chapin's wife, Sandy, actually wrote the words to that song after their son, Josh, was born. It became a self-fulfilling prophecy. And when their son was seven years old, Harry was performing 200 concerts a year. And Sandy asked him when he was going to take some time to be with their son. And Harry promised to make some time at the end of the summer. He never made it. That summer, a truck hit Harry's Volkswagen and he was killed. Seems like I have a lot of stories about people who took time for granted and ended up dying rather unexpectedly. But just saying. The final letter in time is E. And today we're going to call that uh, enjoy. The time you spend with your family should be enjoyable. It should be the best time of your life. Um, here's a couple of ways to enjoy your family time. First of all, say no to family time robbers. There will always be something else to do. 
There will always be, always be somewhere else uh, you could be. But if you're going to make t- spending time with your family a priority, you are going to have to learn the power of that little two-letter word, no. You need to understand that when you say yes to family time, you then have already said no to everything else. But many dads and moms allow interruptions and other demands to detract from their family time. A thousand years from now, what is going to be more important? Spending time with your family or watching some TV show? Nobody on their deathbed said, oh, I wish I'd spent more time at the office. Several years ago, baseball player Ken Griffey Jr. was invited to the Player's Choice Awards, where he was to be awarded the Player of the Decade Award. It's a big deal. It was on national television. He he beat out players of his day like uh, Barry Bonds and Mark McGuire. But when he found out when the award was to be given, he declined to attend. He had something more important to do. His five-year-old son, Trey, was playing in his first baseball game. And Ken wasn't going to miss it. Good for him. You need to learn to say no to some of the things that take you away from your family. And we also mean by that your church family, the family you will have for all eternity. And secondly, we encourage you to say yes to happy memories. Our kids are only going to be with us for a few years, so we must make the most of it. And James writes in uh, 4.14, well, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Turn to the person next to you and say, you don't have very long to live. So let's make some happy times. Time to treasure, time to invest, time to manage, time to enjoy. We are talking about stewardship. The stewardship of time. Time is God's precious gift. All time is God's. How much are you giving him? Are your big rocks, your priorities, in line with God's priorities? Time is God's precious gift. Use it wisely. Offer it all to God. Amen.